Hey, we're here once again. This is Generous Theology with uh, Brock and Chuck. And we're here talking uh, this evening about Herman Bovink's Reform Dogmatics, Volume 2. And as you can probably see on the screen today, we're going to be talking about acquired knowledge. And uh, last week, we spent some time talking about innate knowledge and some things around that. And so this is going to be sort of a, uh, a parallel to that, uh, acquired knowledge and thinking about uh, you know, how do we uh, gain this other kind of knowledge, this acquired knowledge? And some of the discussion, I think, is also going to be uh, how, what what is acquired knowledge uh, as, as it relates to innate knowledge? And uh, are they the opposite kind of thing or are they the similar kinds of things? And uh, so that's a little bit what we're, we're going to be uh, talking about today. And so, Brock, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, just just to start out with, uh, from this particular section on the acquired knowledge of God, um, yeah, I'm interested in in hearing uh, what you have to say. What what did you think about uh, the addition of this particular section and how it relates to some of the uh, topics we talked about last week? Yeah, yeah, and thank you, Chuck. Um, by the way, I have to say, you and I both. Uh, in our appearance today, I think we are we get to be the men in black, which is which is a great designation for us. And uh, I would say this, uh, Chuck, it's an interesting topic, and I really wonder, I really wonder, I wonder its place in discussions today, because historically, as Professor Bovink has surveyed, there's been a, a real strong discussion in pre-modern times and even into modern times about what is knowledge and how is it acquired. And almost everything is driven by explaining or rejecting theistic mechanisms for knowledge. And what an interesting thing. You know, at the at the risk of being uh crass, Chuck, which I, I don't mean to do. <clears throat> I work in the in the tech industry and at the risk of being crass it's a, it's sort of a common trope or saying that um that pornography has driven innovation in the tech industry. And the idea there is that things related to that access of that kind of content has been so lucrative and has been so desired and that, that, that an entire industry has been to, large, to a large degree shaped by it. And I think we have something similar here. This push-pull between theistic and non-theistic explanations about um, why we have knowledge, why people know things, almost is almost entirely driven by this conflict. And what we see is we see uh, Christian theologians and and other other explainers put forward ideas of knowledge acquisition that support the systematic and sustained reading of the scriptures. In other words, knowledge fits within God's design and God's plan, and here's why, and then we go through the list of the reasons. When you come to the other side of it, almost the entire modern litany is, uh, is driven by the need to reject these theistic explanations, and that's led to centuries of conflict over this topic. And in a short answer, Chuck, when I speak to people about knowledge today, and probably when you do as well, we're almost certainly talking about knowledge in a more philosophical vein than I think traditionally people have and that's because there's such 
uh, contention over the theistic versus the the uh, the secularized or atheistic understandings of the term. And so today, for example, um, belief and opinion are prejudiced terms. If I come up and say to you, I believe I have a fact about reality, or I have an opinion about reality that it is a certain way, that is typically considered to be something different than I have knowledge. And the key there is has to do with demonstration or a justified true belief or some other <coughs> rationalistic enlightenment process. And Chuck, I, I guess I didn't fully understand the depths of this conversation throughout the centuries before uh, coming through and reading this from Professor Bobbink. And so with that in mind, you know, I, I really hate to to say that, you know, as pornography has driven technology in the tech industry, this this desire, this this food fight for defining what knowledge is and what it isn't is so intense. And I was really surprised by that. Chuck, um, all things considered. And so what about you? Were you were you surprised when maybe you sort of came to the ferocity of the of the the different camps putting forth their theories and explanations? And and how how in your own mind does um does reading the Bible count uh toward answering these questions of what does it mean to acquire knowledge in our context, knowledge of God? Yeah, I you know, on the one hand, I don't know that I'm surprised per se, uh, because I think there is a sense in which uh, we've seen in in other discussions that that we've had the importance of presuppositions uh, and how presuppositions shape the way that we think about things, and how there's even a sense in which, certain people try to deny that certain presuppositions are in fact presuppositions. And so in, in that respect, perhaps it's not entirely surprising uh, that this issue uh, is, is so important around the concept of knowledge. How do we gain knowledge? Where do we get knowledge? What is knowledge, in fact? Uh, and it, it, in some ways, it's perhaps not surprising that this theistic versus atheistic uh, way of thinking about these issues, uh, uh, you know, is is such, you know, is is such a driver uh, for these discussions. On the other hand, uh, I what I would say is this is because prior to you and I sort of spending some time on philosophy. Um, I was often much more focused on the theology side of things. And reading theology, uh, typically, uh, in my case anyway, I was reading theologians who sort of accept uh, the types of presuppositions that many Christians would have about how we gain knowledge. And so uh, I wasn't aware uh, until we really started reading some philosophy, and that's over the past few years, um, and especially philosophy outside of just the Christian philosophers uh, and outside of sort of some pre-modern uh, philosophers, I, I think I don't know, I, I don't think I really understood sort of the depth of, uh, of the argument and the antipathy uh, perhaps uh, that there is there uh, in, in, in describing these things. In fact, you know, until a few years ago, until we started reading uh, first 19th century uh, philosophy and then some medieval philosophy and and tying it into the, the theological work that we were doing when we started, you and I, when we first started, we were doing reformed ethics uh, by Bavink. Um, I think there is a, a sense in which, um, yeah, it, it it took until uh, you know I had those sort of uh, that philosophical reading to understand what where the issue really lies. Um, 
That said, uh, it's it's interesting to me. Uh, you know, uh, first of all, uh, Bavink himself uh, in this chapter um, is very very clear about uh, uh, sort of where where he's coming from on on these issues. He perhaps doesn't lay them out as as specifically as here I am with these presuppositions, but that's pretty much what's what's happening here and. Uh, um, and and so and he's focused this now less so in in sort of trying to defend those presuppositions and more so in sort of explaining these issues in light of those uh, presuppositions. Now I, I think there's maybe a couple of reasons for that. One is this is still reformed dogmatics. Uh, I think he understands that that while he is answering uh, the arguments of the his contemporary philosophers, many of whom came from uh, this um, atheistic or at least, um, yeah, I mean, atheistic is the right term. Even if people weren't atheists per se, the way they thought about these issues were without God's involvement. And so therefore it is an atheistic uh, way uh, of, of thinking about them. And so he, while he's answering those things, he's still doing so primarily for an audience uh, of, of Christians. So I think that's part of it. I think there might be a piece of it as well that he's writing early enough, uh, as, as you and I have discussed as well, in that you know, late 19th century, even into the early 20th century, uh, even though the push of philosophy was, you know, and the, and the discussions of philosophy really were such that uh, you know, there was an attempt to exclude God as an explanation. Um, there was still a sense in which many folks who did that still saw themselves in some way as Christian. They at least described themselves as such. It's just that they didn't necessarily let that Christian faith, such as it was, uh, really have an impact on on what they were doing uh, in in the world of, of of philosophy, and so there there's a sense in which perhaps there was still at least in the background some idea that most people, at least in the Western world and in 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 Europe and North America, uh, had sort of a base belief that there was some kind of God, whatever that might be. Um, and and that what Bavink was doing was presenting uh, a view that said we've got to take that part seriously. And I wonder he, whether he might have written this section a little bit differently had he been writing, you know, well, what, writing today, but or even if he was writing, you know, after World War One or after World War Two, um, he may have uh, dealt with some of these the, these things. Uh, a little bit differently. What do you think? Is is this uh, is this uh, is my analysis? Does that seem to fit your reading of it? Uh, you know, is that kind of what you're thinking as well as far as uh, Bavink's approach to these topics? Yeah, I, I agree, Chuck. I think I think that's that's the sense I got as well. And something special happened here considering this material for our discussion session for me. Chuck, you and I have talked about <clears throat> the dictionary wars. You know, we've talked about how in a culture, uh, different people start to write the rules and, and not necessarily the laws, but perhaps the mores, the soft influence uh, items, the taboos. Uh, the values that shape people, even if not always at a legal level. And then, of course, we see that <clears throat> eventually that actually does turn into um, to things that affect the deepest levels of society. So, <clears throat> what is a woman? That's, that's a word we've redefined in our cultural context um, in our lifetime. And... You know, Chuck, if you'd have asked me 30 years ago, where where are the theological um, controversies going to come from? You know, I would not have picked, well, we're going to have a big argument over the meaning of that word. Same thing. What does democracy mean? 
What does sound money mean? All of these things. And in preparing for tonight, I realized that this is exactly a continuation of something that the moderns have done um, for hundreds of years. This is a really a continuation of a regular practice and reading about knowledge, the word knowledge and the connotations it has in modernity. I've come to realize, Chuck, that I'm, I'm seeing in, in these battles, I'm seeing the rewrite. So it, it used to be in, in a pre-modern situation that you or I, if we were pre-moderns, living in our pre-modern world. <clears throat> and by the way, this is, I think, you know, I, I'm just joking here, Chuck, but maybe we can, maybe we can um, define modernity as starting from uh, Madonna's material, <laughs> material girl. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we are living in a material world and we are material people. Um, but, but, but more seriously, <clears throat> back to knowledge, I think in the pre-modern situation, Chuck, you and I would have been walking around and we would have had a, a very different understanding of the relationship between knowledge and wisdom and science and belief and demonstration and justification. It really is a different world. And so I almost feel two things. Number one, I feel like, ha ha, Mr. Modern. Mr. Postmodern, I've caught you with your pants down, rewriting the dictionary. And then the second thing I feel is, <clears throat> wow, I have spent most of my life um, thinking, using words that used to have certain connotations that were, that were much more uh, compatible with the Christian ethos and worldview. And now I'm using those words in the way that secular groups have rewritten them. And that shocks me, Chuck, because it makes me think that 100 years from now, uh, people will be having discussions like you and I, and they'll use the modern redefined words for woman, the meaning. And... Somebody 120 years from now will be in a discussion and say, <clears throat> they'll say, why, why did those people in the, in the 19th and 20th century sound so, so incongruous with where we are as society today? And then there's going to be a historian somewhere that pops up and said, oh, boy, do I have some history to tell you. You see, at the time, they actually thought that a woman referred to a biological female. And the whole room is going to go shock, you get shocked and, and be, what? What? They, they, they didn't understand that a woman is something different from that? And so that's what I feel reading this ex essay from Bavink is um, it seems to me that the disaster of modernism goes back so much further uh, than I'd intended. And in some sense, uh, I've been using uh, mostly the modern dictionary for, for most of my life. And, you know, do I regret it? Do I not regret it? It is what it is, Chuck. But the point here is to note that these dictionary wars are happening. That's the first step. As theologians, what do you and I get to do? We get to describe the landscape before we then decide what we like or don't like about the landscape. And so this section for me is Professor Bavink talking about the acquired knowledge. This is a lot of buildup. This is a lot of backstory. We haven't gotten into Bavink himself per se. So Chuck, I just want to maybe, maybe float that over towards you. How would you ease into the text from, from this sort of backstory starting point that, that we're talking about? Yeah, you know, when it comes to definitions of words and things, I think there's a couple of things uh, to remember, and and perhaps uh, it's important to do here in in sort of preparing to read what Bavik has to say. One is that precision is important, right? We we need to pre have 
precision in our definitions and where as much as possible and we've talked a little bit about this as well that you know that that sometimes there's fights about whether this is even possible but as much as possible try to um, use precise terms that we can agree have particular meanings and so uh you know if if we're going to talk about a word like you you often use the the concept of of woman uh you know we it's it's always helpful to use precise terms like um you know biological uh female or uh you know th there's there's been a lot of discussion about is there a difference between the word gender and the word sex um and and having you know having discussions about those things as part of sort of the pre-discussion i think and then being very precise about how we continue to use them and then insisting on that precision from others uh is is important I think another thing, though, that is also just as important, and it's something that you sort of uh, already kind of leaned on a little bit, uh, which is this idea that we have to also understand our own terminology. And we have to understand when we look back that uh, so that we might be using terminology in a way that's different uh, than uh, previous writers. And the longer the time frame that we're talking about, I think sometimes the easier that is to do. When we look back and we read John Calvin, for example, the language is just so different in many ways because he is he's writing in a um, medieval or Renaissance uh, context uh, where things were just very different. And so we we know that some of those concepts that he uses that we have to think about them in terms of of the context but when we get a little bit closer in time and bovink here is 125 years ago it's not quite as long ago uh there's maybe no one uh alive who remembers 125 years ago but there are people alive uh who uh, were alive during the time of you know that herman bovink was alive there are people that we overlap with now who also overlap with herman bovink and and so when when the the gap is that much smaller sometimes it's harder to recognize that change in definition that evolution from one way of thinking about things to another and so it can be uh, a little bit harder uh to um really be precise about what we mean and so it's i think it's also then uh important to to uh really work hard uh at at doing that so all that all that being said, I think it, it's it's useful, and I, I think uh, as we we discuss the, uh, the 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 actual words that that Bavink has written down and his actual discussion about acquired knowledge, uh, there may be times when we need to take a step back and say, okay, let's define our terms, or let's think about how the terminology that Bavink is using. How does that relate to the way that we talk about things, and and why is he using cert, making certain choices in language? Because I think Bobbing also does that pretty regularly because he is teaching his students about modernity and engaging with it, even if his primary audience is is Reformed Christians. He's engaging with these um, modern philosophers, uh, and he often makes choices to uh speak uh, about certain terms and and uh, and use definitions that that you know he, he he might say look we'll we'll for now we'll accept your definition but now let's talk about what that that actually means and and i think that's something uh important uh to do so let me ask you this acquired knowledge in, uh you know in, in implanted knowledge What's what's the difference? What what are we talking about here, and why why is it important? What do you think, Brock? <laughs> why is it so important? <laughs> well, you know, it, Chuck, it, the acquisition of knowledge, the explanation for it is a story, and I think that's what comes out here. And when you get into the realm of storytelling. You're into metaphysics. You're not dealing with science. 
And that's, I think, one of the fundamental things to be that I want to be clear with people right up front, because modern and postmodern uh, movements talk about, well, we don't want to deal with dogma. We don't want to deal with um, religious ideas about things. We want to deal. <clears throat> we want to deal with science. We want to deal with things that are certain. But the truth is, is that when we're discussing these things, we are not doing science. And neither are the moderns, the secular moderns and the secular post-moderns. <clears throat> and, and Chuck, I want to get into that, that difference that you just asked about. I want to get into that. Let me just do call a quick audible because this is so crucial. And I, and I hadn't, I hadn't, inte I, I hadn't intend to talk about this, but <clears throat> it seems to dovetail so much. I've talked Omaha. about that's, that's oh, a, that's oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I've talked about I've talked about the the liberal um Geisteswissenschaften, the humanities, often. And I've talked about them like they're the evil empire. And I think <clears throat> I think that's worth there's there's a kernel of truth there worthy of maintaining and i want to just share why now i'm going to uh i love to be on the 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 mailing lists for new books that are coming out and the uh the, the rutledge series of books in philosophy and religion uh are, are pretty highly esteemed series and you know this is considered <clears throat> to be uh this is basically the geistes wish in shoften <clears throat> you know this is the uh the liberal apparatus <clears throat> putting out new holy texts for lack of a better word and in these dictionary wars in these wars on meaning they're doing something that that, that conservative christians are probably not doing very much and that is <clears throat> You know they're publishing publishing these endless fest shrifts to uh, their new ways of thinking, and so here is one of the titles that came to me just this week. And and to be honest with you, Chuck, I, I might purchase it. I might want to read what it has to say. And you know, boom! Somebody says, "No, you're you're overemphasizing this. We're not in a culture war. We're not having." these discussions nobody's redefining what a woman is boom there we are the second question in that list this new scholarly publication this new uh look to me for for leading values series of philosophical writings on the topic boom what is a woman it's right there now here's the thing chuck i don't begrudge that somebody who's not a Christian would publish a volume like this. I think the thing I begrudge is that the traditional definition is not allowed. So whatever, you know, uh, I should probably buy this book and read it to confirm and make sure, but I, I've been buying these kinds of books for a long time. And I know that whatever I do when I purchase this volume and read what is a woman, I know I'm not going to get a pre-modern conservative Christian answer. And why is that? Because that's been excluded. It's been excluded from the conversation. The Overton window has shifted. And so, um, and so I've, we're in that same business tonight talking about knowledge and wisdom and how these things all relate however they relate when you read something from the moderns and the postmoderns you can you can know for a fact for a certainty that what will be excluded will be a conservative christian um imprimatur on the topic now there's one there's one other way that i that i would show this and that is another work from this same series that came to me 
<coughs> this week. And by the way, I'm thinking about purchasing this. So here's the volume. Raising sexually intelligent kids. Practical skills for parents, carers, and educators. Now, the, uh, sec the clinical sexologist teaches the foundation of a comprehensive sexuality education for children. Now, Chuck, I should buy, <coughs> buy the book first to make sure, but I can, um, I can be almost certain that there's no room in this book for abstinence as a protocol or behavior for raising sexually intelligent kids. I do this to point out that none of these things are accidental. There's this wave, <clears throat> there's this wave sweeping across the country and when it when it is caught, when it is acknowledged, when people bring this up, the answer is Oh, does it look like we're coming for your children? Because, gosh, we would really hate for you to think that. We were just trying to be educators and, and parents and carers, and we want we want to, to raise, uh, you're going to start seeing this, sexually intelligent humans. And, well, are, are, are you against sexual intelligence? Listen, my beef is this. When the culture wars happen, they're going to happen like this. And when we read Bavink, we are reading a previous iteration of this war. So with that in mind, Chuck, I apologize for the long sort of roundabout um, excursus there. But there was a big deal in... Um, in the fight for what is knowledge between um, innate or implanted uh, no ideas for knowledge of God and this acquired knowledge. And so where it typically happens is in the area of justification. Christian, why do you believe what you believe? And the answer is this. Well, I believe because I have knowledge. Oh, oh, you have knowledge. Are you sure you have knowledge? If so, what kind of knowledge is it? And then these questions are asked. Is it acquired knowledge? Did you learn this knowledge? If so, how can you justify that you've actually learned this knowledge living in the world we've lived in? And then the Christian is explaining, well, I went out into the world. I experienced the world. <clears throat> and then I experienced the, the beauty of it. And from there, my senses were just overwhelmed by this world I live. Well, <clears throat> okay, but, but, but how is that knowledge of God? And then someone else will say something, well, you see, I have this idea, this knowledge about God, because he's implanted it in me. And, and there we have Calvin's sense, uh, sensus divinitatus, this seed of religion uh, that is asserted to just be a part of the structure of being designed and built by a creator. And then the modern and the postmodern comes by and says, oh, hmm, how does that work? And once again, the caustic acids of modernity come out. So, so we see Bavink talking about these issues. And so let me just start going through with some of the things that he has to say. And this has been a long excursus there. But I think we needed that to see what's at stake in Bavink's treatment in this section. And so uh, he says this, the knowledge of God with which persons are born and which arises from their own being. That's this innate idea. And then we have the other, the acquired, that which comes to humans from without by observation and serves to augment and expand the former, meaning the innate knowledge. And so Bavink here talks about this. The seed of religion is indeed inherent in humans. It takes the whole field of human life to make it germinate and grow. 
And that really cuts to the heart of what has been described as uh, Bavink's organic theology. Chuck, what do you think about this idea of an organic theology, and why? Why does it why does it have something to offer that these more regimented and and program programatized ideas of knowledge uh, don't quite seem to 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 recognize or do justice with? Yeah, you know, I think the first thing that comes to mind for me here in talking about an organic theology, as opposed to something that's it's more regimented, as, as you put it, is the fact that if we're going to talk about knowledge and human knowledge, uh, I think there is a sense in which uh, we, under, we, we naturally understand that knowledge is more than just our rational thinking about things. And, and the reason I say that we, we, we know this is because we often use terms sort of colloquial like uh, head knowledge uh, versus common sense or uh, I know it in my heart, uh, terms like that uh, that we'll use. Those, that kind of terminology in sort of everyday usage is a recognition that for human beings, knowledge goes far beyond merely the rational creation of, of information via the synthesis of inputs uh, by our brains. There's something more to it. Um, you, you've talked about this a little bit too. How do we know that someone loves us? How do we know that we love someone? Uh, how, how, what, what is the knowledge that we have of love? You, you can't just put it together with sort of rational head knowledge uh, per se. Um, why is it that there is often a discussion of, um, you know, somebody is so smart, but they lack common sense? Uh, uh, and, and, you know, what good is it uh, to uh, to have an IQ of 190 if you don't have any common sense. You know, that's that kind of language that we use sort of in every day recognizes that there are different forms of knowledge. And and while there there is sort of the this more rational kind of knowledge where maybe we're, you know, taking various inputs and rationally thinking through them to come up with, uh, uh, you know, sort of a nugget of knowledge. There are these other ways that we come to know things, and and we have to recognize that. And so, a more organic theology, when it comes to this idea of knowledge, is really a recognition of that that we know in ways far beyond what what uh, the modern philosopher wants to accept as, as what is real knowledge. And, 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 and that sort of naive uh, way of thinking, and I, by naive, I don't mean stupid. I mean, it's just this natural ability that we have to sort of think through things without necessarily having to, to go to the ivory tower and figure it all out. That that sort of naive knowledge is is important knowledge. It's it's something that we have to uh, take into account. And and a more organic uh, theology when it comes to knowledge uh, does that. It 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 understands that there are uh, there's this much broader category of of ways that we come to know and and de you know what constitutes knowledge. It, it's it's more than just sort of that um, very regimented uh, way of thinking. And so uh, Bavink here in sort of recognizing that uh, and, and talking about sort of, uh, you know, some of these differences between sort of innate and, and acquired knowledge and, and how do we gather that and, and what are the different ways that we get that and doing so in a more organic way uh, really does, um, it, it, it really does deal with the whole person with uh you know with the fact that we are more than just a brain on a stick uh but that uh we are we are holistic people made up of uh of bodies and souls and and minds and uh, you know and and we have to take that 
uh, into account. Now, uh, uh, assuming that, you know, assuming you don't think that I'm jumping off the deep end here, uh, and we've talked a little bit about this stuff, so I'm, I'm thinking you're not out there saying, Chuck, what are you talking about? You're crazy. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested, though, in, in, you know, how do you, how do you connect that idea of an organic theology uh, with this discussion of an acquired uh, knowledge of God? And, and how, how do you think Bavink, uh, you know, what's your analysis of how, how Bavink does this and how well does he do it? And does he answer some of those questions that we've raised in sort of the build out to this? Chuck, that's fabulous. Uh, Professor Bavink says some things here that really, um, that are just, they're some of the most beautiful things. And, and I'm looking through, I'm scrolling through uh, right now, looking for what I had, what I had outlined because uh, I was just so impressed by it. And let me, let me start with this one here. First of all, is this. Uh, Professor Bavink says, the difference is not that innate knowledge of God has its source in humans, while acquired knowledge arises from the world. But in the case of the innate knowledge of God, God's divine revelation acts upon the human consciousness creating impressions and intuitions. In the case of the acquired knowledge of God, human beings reflect upon that revelation. Their minds go to work. Thought processes are set in motion. And with clear heads, they seek by reasoning and proof to rise from the observation of creatures to the reality of God. Now, that was beautiful, Chuck, but Bob Vink has more. He says this, humans are not content with impressions and intuitions. It is not sufficient for them to know. They want to know they know. They desire to explain the how and the why of their knowledge. This is also why faith aspires to become theology, and the innate knowledge of God seeks to complete itself in the acquired knowledge of God. So, so rather than being opposites, innate knowledge versus acquired knowledge, rather than being um, completely orthogonal or independent of each other, rather than being completely different categories. In fact, in some way, there is um, there is a compatible uh, quality to them. Now, your, your, your build out here was so beautiful when you talked about the organic uh, nature of knowledge. And I was struck with another quote from Professor Bavink. He says this, It is. It only used that language, and that means here the language of innateness, to indicate that a knowledge of God never needs to be instilled in people by coercion and violence, nor by logical argumentation or compelling proofs, but belongs to humans by their very nature and arises spontaneously and automatically. And then Bavink says what I think is the home run. Humans in the course of a normal development arrive at a certain knowledge of God without compulsion or effort. Now, Chuck, I understand why my atheist friends gnash their teeth at these metaphysical thoughts of Bavink's. I can hear it now. Prove it. I can hear that. The second thing I can hear is 
you're just speaking dogmatically. And I'm like, duh, what do you think metaphysics is? <clears throat> but as soon as we frame things in this fashion, we have to consider what is an un comfortable thing to talk about chuck and that is this people who do not acknowledge this dimension to knowledge are modern and postmodern atheist friends in some sense we have to talk about the human animal in declension and now we're back to the noetic effects of sin. Chuck, we are fallen creatures. And not just fallen in the sense of, oh, I tripped. I was walking down the street. I tripped. I fell. I hurt my knee. Now my knee hurts. And I can't walk as well as I could. But fallen in the sense that there is this desire, this aggressive desire to rewrite God out of the picture. Whatever the picture is, take him out. And that is, I think, the Achilles heel of the Geistus Wischenschaften. And once you see, once you see that our humanities friends will entertain almost any theory of knowledge, but this pre-modern conservative Christian ethos, then, then the question is it, to ask is why? And and that's where I kind of want to go with that, Chuck. I'm not. I'm not here to. I'm not here to to laugh at my atheist friends for being quote unquote lesser beings, as if as if I weren't a sinner. But just to just to say that the stakes are high, and when when we define reality in such a way as to exclude God at every turn and at every corner, I think the question worth answering is why. And so Professor Bobbink here says these beautiful things, and, and that was very illuminating to me. Chuck, how was it for you reading this language, and what did it sort of evoke in your mind and in your thought processes? Yeah, so first of all, you know, I, I think you've identified a couple of really key uh, portions of, of this chapter, things that are really worth uh, thinking on. And, and I... I, I liked that that section uh, that um, that that you uh, referred to. Second of all, there that this idea that knowledge of God never needs to be instilled in people by coercion or violence, not by logical argumentation or compelling proofs, but belongs to humans by their very nature and arises spontaneously and automatically. And and I think you know as I was reading that, I was I was, and then the, the, it goes further to to talk about how innate knowledge and and uh, acquired knowledge aren't opposition in opposition to each other they're not total so total opposites that they're fighting each other uh, that but uh, because there is a sense in which innate knowledge is also acquired in a particular way revelation comes first uh, but uh, I, I was thinking about well so what is the answer of a more atheistic view on on these things and uh, as I as I begin this, I, I'm I'm going to you know give the caveat here that not being atheistic myself, it is sometimes hard for me to imagine um, how they how they make those arguments. And so, if I'm misrepresenting anything in a particular way, um, I, I apologize for that. But here here's the question that I have. In some ways, I think Bavink by talking about innate and acquired knowledge is making a particular point right so in, in and we've talked about this before as well that that uh in the 19th century uh way of thinking start you know starting earlier with kant but then moving moving forward there is this idea that the way that we learn the way that we gain knowledge is you know we may perceive a particular set of information uh, in a particular way, we may see another set of information, and then we, uh, rather than sort of, uh, you know, okay, we know this, we know this, there's always sort of this 
thin synthesis going on where we're, we're taking one way that one thing that we know, we're taking another thing that we know, and we're trying to synthesize them in some way to come up with a new uh, form of, of knowledge. And I think the, the uh, brilliance of Bobbing here is to talk about innate and acquired knowledge because in some ways, uh, by using that language, it at first appears that what he's doing is accepting sort of those grounds that, okay, if we think about how do we know things? Well, yeah, there is sort of innate knowledge. And, and then there's knowledge that we acquire. Oh, okay, now how do we... How do we put those two together? How do we how do we synthesize these seemingly opposite ideas into a new uh, idea about things? But then what Bobbing does is he doesn't do that at all, right? Uh, he instead he says, look, these these aren't necessarily opposites. They're they they relate to each other in in many different ways. And in fact, innate knowledge is a form of acquired knowledge in some ways, even though uh, it, it it is also different in 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 many ways and the the atheistic thinker has now got to address well what do we think is there innate knowledge okay instinct that kind of thing uh, is there acquired knowledge yeah we we acquire knowledge in in various ways whether it's empirically whether it's rationally um, how do those things relate uh, and are they really the opposite things? What 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 can instinct or innate knowledge tell us about how we how we learn these things? And in the end, I think, and, and this is again, I'm I'm working from from my perspective here. I think what Bavink is is trying to do is point out that you always have to sort of step back to. Well, okay, if, if, if we have instinctual knowledge, where does that come from? What is the nature of that? And, you know, today, a lot of people would say, well, it's evolutionary. It's evolutionary theory. It's, it's sort of evolved in us because we had to deal with certain things. And, and, and well, okay, so is that innate knowledge, acquired knowledge? Okay, then how did we acquire it? And was there some sort of innate knowledge that allowed us to acquire it? Okay, yeah, you know, maybe it was that, you know, it, we had to understand, so we had to perceive sort of the our environment around us in, in order to know how to react to it. And so then when certain animals or certain beings did so in a way that was more, um, you know, uh, more beneficial for them, well, they, they, they're the ones who continued survive us, so, you know, survival of the fittest. And so the evolutionary process continued. But as you build backwards and backwards and backwards, where where is the beginning? What is what is the acquired or innate knowledge of a single celled uh, creature? Um, what is the innate or acquired knowledge of um, amino acids that sort of happen to come together, uh, you know, on some bare ro barren rock three billion years ago? Um, and 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 I'm 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 an old earther, so I, you know I'm not I'm not saying oh this is this is all ridiculous that we're we're going to think that way. But the, I think what Bavin does here is says, look, there still has to be a place for something to be added in, for there to be some somewhere that we acquire this knowledge, and it can't just go on and on and on to the beginning. You know, you know, it, was there some knowledge inherent in the Big Bang somehow? Is is there is there some information that that sort of synthesized, you know, from just the Big Bang? Um, and and I think what what Bob Inc. is trying to do here is is in many ways make a case that that pre that atheistic presupposition is faulty on its own uh, and. If it's faulty on its own, if, if if you can if you can sort of cut the legs out from under that presupposition, well, what does that leave us? This is not a synthesis of atheistic and a theistic view, but rather a cutting out of the legs uh, underneath an atheistic view of things to recognize that the, the only way that we can think about these things is theistically, 
and so therefore our presum our presuppositions or presumptions that 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 we have when we when we talk about these things that Bavink has in 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 working through these things is is reasonable and actually must be taken into account and once we take into account that there must be some outside power this god and, and that you know maybe you know you know maybe a, a, a someone who's sort of thinking through these things hasn't come to fully accept the idea of a you know a personal god who uh, created everything but but there must be something that this god is well now where does that come from and how do we get the knowledge from that god well here it, it has to come from some form of revelation and so I, I, I just, I, it, it, it seems to me as I read through this that Bavink is again maybe using some of the language of modern thinkers, but doing it in some ways to undercut uh, the very basis for uh, the arguments that those those folks make. Now, you tell me, Brock, even uh, even though I know that you come from the same perspective uh, as I do, very similar uh, perspectives. Am I being unfair to the atheistic way of thinking here, or do you think that's really what's 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 happening? <clears throat> Chuck, I, I I love I love the analysis. I think you're spot on, and this is this is a really pressing issue, and and, and let me explain why I think it is. Chuck, you and I come together and, and we have an argument over some issue of knowledge. And you say to me, <clears throat> Brock, it's my opinion that reality is X. It's my belief that re reality is X. And, I, and then I come to you, Chuck, and I say, no, Chuck, my friend. I have knowledge, I have science, that reality is Y, not X. Now, if it's true, genuine scientific knowledge, I've got you. But what have we seen in our lifetime? We've seen really an abuse, uh, an overstatement, where people want to project things that science actually does give us and indicate out into areas that are metaphysical, where science cannot go, where science cannot answer. And knowledge is perhaps the classic big, big, uh, <clears throat> big area here. And I want to tell you, there's nowhere more obvious to me that this is occurring than in what um christian apologist cliff connectly calls the six miracles of atheism now we're talking going to talk about knowledge here but cliff talks about six reasons why he cannot be an atheist and it has to do with knowledge and so he says this the miracle that existence comes from non-existence. That's number one. The miracle that order comes from chaos. It's number two. The miracle that life comes from non-life. Number three. Number four. The miracle that the personal comes from the non-personal. Number five. The miracle that reason comes from non-reason. Then number six, the miracle that morality comes from matter. Now, are we talking about miracles? I thought we were talking about knowledge. The point is, is that when you press the moderns, and the postmoderns on this, it should be immediately apparent that we are not dealing with an explanation about knowledge that is of a scientific character, that we're out in the left field of metaphysics. 
And Chuck, <clears throat> my scientifically minded atheist friends like to point at my Christian dogma and laugh. <laughs> He's speaking dogmatically. <laughs> And then when it comes to all of these important questions, they're doing the same thing. And so I would love for us Christians to be aware of this and to point it out, not for the purpose of laughing at our atheist friends, but for the purpose of displaying the vista of the kind of knowledge that the Bible speaks about. And let me just give a few verses here, Chuck. In 2 Peter 1, 2, the text says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Why? Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory excellence so Chuck knowledge here is not simply an academic search for justified true belief it's not simply a search for demonstration those things are important they matter let's talk about them but we're actually in the deep waters of metaphysics and science can't help us here science <coughs> science is limited to the shallows when it comes to metaphysics, Chuck, we're in the deep water. Second Peter 1.8 says this, if you possess these qualities that he's talking about in chapter 1 and continue to grow in them, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> so we're talking here about knowledge in the context of this wonderful theological realization. Chuck, we as creatures are a certain way. And then God, as the creator, has come in response to that way. And he, and he comes and he brings us knowledge of this. Again, Chuck, we're describing the landscape. What does God say in the scriptures? Be ye holy, for I am holy. Well, Chuck, I'm in, I'm in trouble with such a God. Why? Because in myself, I am not holy. And so if God comes down and has a criteria for acceptance that I cannot meet, then I'm not fit for anything but the garbage pile. I'm not fit for anything but the kind of reception my unfitness makes me deserve. And that knowledge is humbling. And so the gospel comes into us in the midst of this. Chuck, this is so much more important than what Plato thought or Aristotle thought, though I love reading what the philosophers have to say. This is concerning a fundamental metaphysical need. And we don't improve our ontological condition by just talking about knowledge in such a way as to exclude this. And I think that's, for me, the big win of this section from Professor Bavink. God has come, he has brought knowledge, and this knowledge should do something in us. It should enable us by grace to turn from unwholesome ways, turn to wholesome ways. And then what happens after that? We have hope. Why do we have hope? We have hope because we hang on to the knowledge of his promises. And that is knowledge of an entirely different character than our philosopher and our atheist-minded friends want to talk about. And I think society and the culture is so much poorer because of that decision.
So for me, Chuck, this was huge. Professor Boving had something to say. <clears throat> he said it. And he, he linked it back to these classical categories of knowledge, innate, acquired, talked about what the philosophers had to say, and then he brought forth this metaphysical situation. And I think that displays an open-mindedness uh, and a courage to look at reality in a way that many of us, I'm speaking in the general sense here, that people oftentimes have a tough time doing. You know, there was that, what was that movie, Chuck, from the, was it the late 80s, early 90s? Uh, was it maybe a few good men, I think? It was uh, <clears throat> Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise. And there's that famous courtroom scene where Tom Cruise is the lawyer <clears throat> and Jack Nicholson is playing, I think, maybe a general who's on the on the stand being deposed. And uh, Tom Cruise and he get into a discussion about something and Tom Cruise says, I want the truth. And then Nicholson's line, if I remember it correctly, you can't handle the truth. Well, friends, <clears throat> when, we, when we think of knowledge in a modern or postmodern secularist way, I want to shake my beloved secular friends. You can't handle the truth. Not because... I hate them, not because I want to rule over them, but because I want to make them aware of the knowledge of the hope that is in Jesus Christ. Chuck, how would you build on that? And how do we how do we wrap this section off? Where does that leave us? Well, I think it leaves us with, uh, you know, first of all, um, just a, a, a a growing sense of the importance of knowledge and of God's knowledge and that all knowledge re really is God's knowledge. And when we reject that knowledge, then to quote that verse from Hosea, the people perish because of the lack of, of knowledge. Uh, and so uh, I think what, what this really does, this discussion, it just underlines uh, the importance of of knowledge, and we and we can deal with that in, in all sorts of different ways. Uh, you know, one one of course is uh, to to be praying to God uh, for uh, knowledge, to grow in His knowledge, uh, and for the Holy Spirit to give us a sense uh, that um, that that we can know that the knowledge that we have is the knowledge that that comes from God. But I think also with that is even though we we as reformed believers we understand that uh, there's nothing that we can do on our own that uh, our knowledge must first of all come from God. I think we also then still have um, the obligation to do something with that knowledge. It's sort of it's sort of akin to the idea of justification and sanctification, right? Uh, with justification, we are made right with God, not by any act of ours, our own, but, but totally by the grace of God. And similarly, uh, with knowledge, uh, the fact that we even have any kind of knowledge, that we have the ability to gain knowledge, that we can that we can see, uh, you know, God's creation and 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 learn from it, uh, is entirely a gift of God. But then, like sanctification, we participate in in growing that knowledge with with fear and trembling, uh, to, you know, to be sure to make to because we want to make sure that we're we're uh, growing in that knowledge in a way that that is appropriate, uh, you know, and uh, in in a way that brings honor and glory to God rather than dishonor. Uh, but also, you know, in, in in many ways, not only with fear and trembling, but also with joy. Because what a gift it is that we have this knowledge, and what a gift it is that we can explore knowledge in many different ways. You know, the, the folks who are uh, watching these videos here, you know, they may have some interest in so some of these, uh, you know, these philosophical issues around uh, knowledge. There may be others who don't don't have that same interest, but yet they also uh, have, um, I think, the 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 task the the task given to us by the Creator to develop knowledge in whatever sphere of life 
uh, they they may be existing. Maybe it it is as a software developer or as a lawyer like like you and and like me. Maybe it is as you know a, a homemaker who is is exploring ways to 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 use. Um, the resources that that he or she's been given, you know, to to make meals that that are um, that are healthy, but but also frugal. Or maybe it is a teacher who is looking at ways of of instilling knowledge in in different ways in their students and on students who have, you know, who who've been created in unique and wonderful ways by their creator, but also meaning that they learn in different ways and thinking how can we apply that knowledge to these different kinds of folks. Maybe it's, you know, the, the knowledge of a farmer who understands the cycles of the seasons that they're dealing with and, and understands how to uh, get the most out of that and how to deal uh, with the, the difficulties that can come because of uh, of the vagaries of the of the weather. There's all sorts of areas that that God has given us to to increase in knowledge, to dive into that knowledge and and all of us, every single person made in the image of God uh, has has been given that task uh, to develop uh, that knowledge in in a particular way in a way that's unique uh, to them because God has given them the ability to relate to that knowledge and in unique ways. And so that I, I think that's really super exciting. Chuck, I'm with you. It really is exciting. And it makes me, it points out the fact that in pre-modern times, knowledge had a doxological character to it. And what does that mean? Well, for, for viewers, we're just saying that when you encounter things in reality, you know, you see that beautiful sunset, or you see the mountains in the distance, or you go to the ocean and see that expanse spread out before you in all of its beauty, in all of its grandeur. It is not an accident that you are filled with some degree of wonder with some degree of, wow, that, that is in fact an invitation for the knowledge that's being impressed upon you to stimulate you to praise. And this is what Professor Bavink would say is the essentially religious character of reality. There it is, Chuck. We couldn't get around it. Reality is essentially religious in its character. And what do we mean by that? Well, when we read Professor Bobbing, we start to understand science is wonderful for talking about questions of mechanism. How? How does, <clears throat> does something happen in the world? You know, I put tea on uh, the stove and I heat the water of the tea and it gets hot. <clears throat> and when that tea gets hot, then uh, I put the put the tea bag in, and and something wonderful happens. But it's the why question that matters. Why did I put the tea on the stove to be heated? And it's that human search for meaning that is so often excluded from science that is absolutely essential and bears this religious character. Now I know our atheist friends are not going to agree with that. <clears throat> And we're going to have some wrestling matches. <coughs> and excuse me, Chuck, I think we're going to lose some of the wrestling matches. I don't have all of the answers, but I think we're going to win a lot of these wrestling matches too. And I think when we come with this view of knowledge, this view of wisdom and belief and opinion, I think something good and wholesome and wonderful is going to come out of it. And Chuck, it makes me want to praise the Lord. So with that in mind, my friend, would you would you give us some last thoughts and, and maybe close us with a prayer? Absolutely. Let's let's praise God together. I think we can do that in as part of the uh the closing prayer. Our Father in heaven, praise be to you. Praise be to you, the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. 
oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge that, that you have, oh God. How unsearchable are your judgments and, and your paths beyond all tracing out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to you that, that you should repay them? For through you and from you and for you are all things. And so to you be the glory forever. Amen. And yet you give us this, this knowledge. You give us the, the ability to participate in, in union with your son, Jesus Christ, and to, to, to have a, at least a, a, a sense of, of your mind and, and at least a, a, a modicum of the knowledge of the Lord. And we just praise you and we thank you uh, for that wonderful gift that gift of knowledge. And so to you, the King eternal, immortal, and invisible, our only God, be to you honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.